Guten Abend. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome here at the Allianz Forum in Berlin, as well as more than 300 viewers who are following the live stream of this event in more than 30 countries, among others in Israel and Honduras, I was told. Welcome to all of you. My name is Jana Werner. I'm a political journalist and I'm very pleased to be able to guide you through the next 75 minutes because tonight we will be talking about the future of political discourse. This was initiated by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. For more than 100 years, the English writer Evelyn Beatrice Hall in her uh, work, Friends of Voltaire, the French um, enlightener, said, I'm not, I don't agree with what you say, but until you die, I will defend your right to say it. This is a core sentence of democracy. It's a, f it's in a f fighting spirit, which should still be true today in a period when we have more and more polarization in pol in, on the political stage. So how can we safeguard our culture of debates, our freedom of speech and expression? What are the tasks? What are the responsibilities? And what obligations do the media take? What coverage do we provide and who do we ignore? This is the t topic that we want to address with our panelists. This event is a part of this year's global theme of the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for Freedom, which is disinformation and media freedom. Originally, this was supposed to be a congress, which is why we have a live stream also in English tonight. Due to the fact that the congress cannot be held as usual uh, due to reasons you are all aware of, we have a hybrid format, but also several web talks. We had one this afternoon on the influence of social media. Tomorrow, international guests will be looking for solutions for protecting the society from disinformation, which I would like to invite you to. Before we start kicking off with our live panelists and before I introduce them to you, we will have a short greeting from the former Minister of Justice and the Deputy Chairwoman of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Sabine Leuthäuser Schnarrenberger. And after that, we will have a video greeting from Güde Jensen for family related reasons. She can't be here tonight, but she will. Um, show a video. She is a member of the German Bundestag and is the chairwoman of the Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid of the German Bundestag. So now I would like to welcome uh, Sabine Leuthäuser-Schnarrenberger. Ms. Werner, Ms. Koch, Mr. Jugel, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you here and in the live stream. I'm very pleased that you followed the invitation of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. I'm very pleased that we have the chance to talk about the future of the political discourse against the back uh, backdrop of disinformation, freedom of expression and responsibility. I'm very pleased that we have chosen a hybrid format and being able to be here tonight together. This is something different. This is really nice. Um, publishing how the houses media journalists, they contribute to uh, the diversity of opinion building in our society and they have a huge uh, responsibility. Facts and comments instead of fake news and the myths of temptation are needed more than ever. But how about the discourse? Is that taken away by those who only are interested in their own opinions? and are not interested in scientific expertise and facts. For those journalists, chair, um, uh, news anchors, and the classical media are only the so-called lying press for them, or maybe I could choose another catchword. Maybe they are the system media to those people which means media which don't provide free and independent coverage, but, but which are controlled by 
policy makers by some elite and which do not provide information and participation in a multiple discourse, in a diversified discourse. This is the spectrum in which the the discourse has existed for a while and two stakeholders promote uh, tolerance uh, against or tolerance for the opposing opinion. For one thing, civil society disinformation stakeholders in all forms and maybe you read the Spiegel magazine, maybe you know more about the QAnon movement, which also in Germany has its followers. So these two stakeholders are dangerous to the free discourse. The second uh, stakeholder is the state. If it issues state censorship and intelligence-based troll activities and disinformation. We've always, ha we've always had uh, intelligence organizations for decades and uh, centuries, so troll activities is a rather new phenomenon. But both are dangerous for uh, freedom of expression. And due to this development, which is really worrying the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for freedom embraced this topic as an annual uh, theme for 2020. Dear uh, Mr. Yujel, you had to face the harsh consequences of what happens if a, a country, a state such as Turkey, does, is not interested in hearing the opinion of a free journalist, uh, but rather perceives it as a threat, thus uh, exerting all its power of enforcement, of law enforcement, imprisons independent journalists uh, such as you, but also other journalists, uh, closes down publishing houses such as Hurriet. And journalists in more and more countries are facing a similar situation. Hungary has been losing its publishing houses independence but also look at Poland, where the the state prescribes how media are to be interpreted. And if they don't obey, they are being perceived as being a threat to the state. In Russia, journalists have uh, had a very dangerous uh, reality for years. I only want to mention uh, Ms. Politkovska, yeah, I don't even want to go into China. But even in the United States of America, journalists have become the favorite opponents of uh, the president who really assails them in a, a kind of language which is not really common for a g head of state. So. Freedom of expression, which is a fundamental precondition for democracy, is under pressure. And it, it is also difficult because opinions of others, also uh, controversial opinions, are not easy to tolerate. So having a fact-based Discussion is important, is essential for our democracy. We need it, but we also we need the framework for it. We need the rule of law, which um, r reprimands unwanted and un um, and illegal dis transgressions and sanctions them. So this is the framework in which we want to discuss and want to take a sounding of how we can take this essential element in our democracy and how we can safeguard it and defend it. How can we make a distinction from and differentiate from what threatens it? This is something that uh, is rather difficult for us to do. So we need visible commentary. We need visible statements. And we need these independent uh, journalists who sometimes f are facing a shitstorm by the media. There's polarization and radicalization which have changed the discourse. So we want to 
defend the freedom of opinion and the freedom of the press and let's talk about the threats and we want to do so tonight so welcome again freedom of the press and freedom of opinion are human rights this is enshrined in article 19 of the universal declaration of human rights so tonight uh, we want to talk about the future of political discourse between disinformation freedom of expression and responsibility this is hosted by the friedrich naumann foundation i want to uh, say a few words about these three buzzwords i mentioned it article 19 is the article which freedom of the press and freedom of expression can refer to worldwide and many other fundamental rights are based on this this means that if we see that freedom of, pre of the press and freedom of expression is under attack worldwide at the same time we see that other fundamental rights are being eroded this is why the ranking by reporters without borders which is published every year on freedom of the press can be interpreted like a prognosis for countries where the entire democratic or political system the societal system is more and more eroded. Journalists, are, and Dennis Tijel is only one of them, you will ha be able to discuss with him later. Journalists are in the front line when it comes to defending freedom of the press and freedom of expression because they provide independent research and they make it possible for us people who consume the media to get different kinds of points of view on reality. So what does this mean specif specifically? I will provide an answer later, but before I want to mention a few countries where we see that freedom of the press and freedom of expression are increasingly under pressure. It's you don't have to go that far in order to find these countries. We also have these countries here in Europe. but. Some countries which we tend not to focus on include countries such as the Philippines, where we, where uh, an emergency law was adopted, which caused the largest TV station to get off the grid overnight, making it impossible for them to work. Hong Kong is an um, it is an example which everybody is talking about at the moment, but we mustn't forget that we have one country, two systems there. Since the joint declaration when Hong Kong was given back to the People's Republic of China by the British, that Hong Kong has freedom of the press and freedom of uh, speech. But since the security law was passed, people can no longer express their opinions freely. They self-censor. And there's a very prominent example of the editor, Jimmy Lai, who was sent to prison simply because he edits and publishes a rather independent newspaper. So he was only released on bail now. If we are witnessing that in Hong Kong, a law can be enacted retros retroactively, this is a law that was only passed recently, but it is retroactive. So people can send to prison even if their so-called crimes were committed earlier. And then we have uh, Turkey. This is an example which uh, Denis Yücel can say a lot more about than I, but I want to stress that still journalists are imprisoned uh, away from the public eye uh, simply because they want to provide independent coverage. And this is done on spurious grounds of uh, funding or supporting terrorism in the state of Turkey. Then we have countries such as the United States of America. You would assume that they are a democracy, that there is a freedom of the press and freedom of expression. But not only when it came to the Black Lives Matter protests, but also earlier we saw that journalists' activities, for example, in covering such protests, was increasingly infringed on. There was a study conducted by Gelling Bellingcat and The Guardian, which described 148 cases of attacks on journalists. 
these cases need to be documented and need to made be need to be made pub public. This is a no go because at the end of the day, it restricts access for free citizens to consume opinions and media freely. If we look uh, at Europe, during the last few weeks, we were all interested in the trial of the murder of Jan Kuciak and his fiancée. Those responsible were not held accountable. Reporters Without Borders um, issued a, a drastic statement about it. There we see that the po population is really much more interested in freedom of the press and freedom of expression, even more so than before. In Hungary, we can witness how President Orban, not only during the corona pandemic, but even before, infringes upon freedom of expression and freedom of the press, because it doesn't fit his political worldview. Of course, we also need to look to Germany, because we can only be credible if we are critical of ourselves, of our own situation, of freedom of expression and freedom of the press and our own situation of human rights, we need to look at where we can make an improvement. In Germany, there were several situations this year where from a human rights point of view, a uh, freedom of speech point of view, we can make an improvement. On the 1st of May, there was an attack on uh, reporters of a TV station from ZDF. They were um, beaten up really badly. Again and again, journalists are being harassed and uh, kept from independent coverage or even threatened. So we as a parliament, we as citizens have a responsibility to object to this. Because if in Germany it's no longer possible to speak your mind freely, but also to disseminate information freely, this is in relates to other possibilities to restrict our freedom of expression and to restrict the rule of, rule of law. We mustn't uh, let this happen. And we, as the Free Democrats in the Parliament, don't accept this. If we look at how independent journalists work here in Germany, who receive training here in Germany, at the same time, we need to take into account the situation of foreign journalists. I would like to mention Russia Today and the People's Republic of China. We learned uh, the term uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, especially during the corona crisis. This is a notion which uh, is established by the People's Republic of uh, China. So diplomats from China don't just act as diplomats here, but rather they uh, manipulate public opinion here, especially in social media. Maybe you will talk. We'll be talking about Mr. Navalny with uh, Sabine Leuthauser Schnarnberger. She ha has issued quite uh, some statement about this um, occurrence. The case of Alexei Navalny showed us how Russian uh, media tried to reinterpret the narrative of this poisoning, and they questioned or they put put out there the question of whether this poisoning couldn't have happened in Germany. This was even embraced by colleagues from the German Bundestag, um, among others from the faction Die Linke. So we need to ask the question of what we are doing with all this information. What do we as free Democrats want to suggest in order to be able to protect freedom of expression? and in order to counteract infringements. And the m a major component is media competence, which needs to be in curricula. This is something that the federal government needs to focus on. At international level, something we can do, I sent a letter to the Federal Foreign Office, which wasn't answer, and I demanded for a special commissioner in the United Nations for freedom of the press. We are witnessing that journalists in all kinds of countries can no longer practice their jobs freely. So in order to have someone to take care of this uh, topic uh, at high level within the United Nations, we need a special commissioner only focusing on this topic and entering in a dialogue with the countries concerned and pointing out um, bad situations. 
the last point I want to make is to appeal to each and every one of you, because I talked a lot about um, governments and countries' responsibilities. But in the end of the day, every one of us has a responsibility, namely to take responsibility in our democracy to t ensure that you can express your opinion, to provide arguments in order to counter act falsehoods. These days we are witnessing that uh, in the corona pandemic people complain about not being allowed to um, express their opinion freely while they are in the street expressing their opinions freely. And I think we need to take care that the rule of law um, is upheld and this is happening. Uh, in Berlin, the interior senator cancelled a demonstration against corona measures in, in preemptive obedience, but then the, co the administrative court ca ruled that the demonstration could take place and this shows us that the rule of law is very much active and functional. This possibility, this option should be chosen every time and again and again, if people maintain that the rule of law is no longer functioning in Germany. This is something that the AFD and partly the, li uh, the left parliamentary group are doing. And if we mention Germany uh, in the same sentence as other countries, we revive those societies in China, in Hong Kong, in Hungary who are struggling and it belittles the situation in autocratic uh, regimes. We need to put this topic uh, uh, on the agenda again and again. So freedom of the press, freedom of expression is work, but uh, this is also part of it. We must not rest. We must not take these values for granted that belong to a free democracy. We need to be able to tolerate those op opinions even if they are not our own. That said, I want to wish you a great discussion with Tanit Koch, Dennis Yudel, and of course, uh, Sabine Leuthäuser Schnarrenberger, our mouthpiece when it comes to f freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and human rights. But I'm already looking forward to discussing with you directly um, as soon as possible, and I would like to wish you a very nice evening. Well, we've heard it from Güter Jensen, Article 19 of the Declaration on Human Rights of the UN and also our German Basic Law. We have the right to have our own opinion, to talk about it and to spread it. What is reality like? That's what we want to speak about today. What is the future of the political discourse? course. Let me welcome Tanit Koch, Dennis Jüksel and again Sabine Leuthäuser Schnarrenberger. In I would like to introduce them a bit more. Um, Ms. Leuthäuser Schnarrenberger was deputy, um, is a deputy chairperson of the board of directors of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. She studied law and political sciences. She was a member of German the German Bundestag and uh, Federal Minister of Justice. Tanit Koch uh, was editor-in-chief of the Bild newspaper. Now she's editor-in-chief of the Atrial Media Group and N24 News Channel. Dennis Yüksel also studied political sciences and um, was an author for the Tats Daily. He went to Turkey as a correspondent for the German newspaper Die Welt. We followed this on, um, on the media. You were imprisoned in Turkey for 367 days without trial. You were You were supposed to have convicted crimes based on terrorism uh, in connection to PKK. And um, th 
there were many, and this was based on the reports, the articles you wrote. So your goal was to return to the political stage as a journalist. How did that go for you? Hello, good evening. It's not as empty as I had um, originally expected it to be. But it's a question I don't think I can answer completely. I can only speak a bit about how I feel. I spent my holidays in Sicily with my wife. I went there after my imprisonment, my incarceration. So there's a tendency to have a third home nowadays. So Sicily is on the top of my list. I had my last working day a while ago, and I spent it in Dresden, uh, watched Mr. Kalwitz and his successor. Um, I also went to Essen and Bülheim in order to do some research. I'm sure you know this, the right-wing scandal in the Hesse police. What does the city think about it and why did no one notice this beforehand? I think I'm on a good um, path to um, taking my life as a journalist back. I'm active on social media. Or I'm rather what I read on social media or other events is that people tell me, well, I really was committed, I um, fought for you. Usually that meant um, posting a retweet. And then people write, people tell me, had I known that this is something you would write now, then I would not have done it. And I'm very grateful for this because it's something um, when it comes to me working for the TATS, I wasn't really such a characteristic, characteristic figure as a journalist, but now mm, this has changed, be it the um, left-wing party or the Green Party, the jungle world, the Bild, or others hosting events. So suddenly, when it comes to me personally, it was a about something, an, an important topic. So I served as an um, example for freedom of the press. So it's something that ha a lot of institutions have in common. And I became a poster boy, although I didn't want to be one, of course. Still, I mean, if you're imprisoned in isolation, mm, I was allowed to play football once a week for one hour and even there I was on my own. I was able to buy a football in the prison shop. So it's not uh, being in prison in the Turkey is not like midnight in Midnight Express. So I was able to buy cigarettes, of course, and other amongst other things. But putting someone in isolation is a way of torture. Um, playing football on my own also had advantages because I basically always won. So back at the time, I made different experiences, but today I found my way back to normality. I'm in touch with people from many different walks of lives and um, they get angry at me, they tell me, well, had I known that I would not have um, spoken out for you, some of them want me back in, in prison, and that's okay because that's no a sign of normality. I'm a living monument now, more or less, or ha was at the time, and I don't think it would have been something I could have done forever. And it would also have meant having prison with me all the time and I don't think that would be good. Now you asked me that and I di really didn't expect to tell this story again. I also wrote about this in my book. There's a personal dimension, a political dimension about what happened to me. But allow me to say that I want to move on. Maybe one more thing when it comes to torture and being imprisoned. I mean, it was severe, but mm, just to say, 
So it was serious what happened to me, but to stay in reality, I'm also not the journalist who was mm, who made the worst experience of them all. Uh, I was only in prison for a year. Others have been in prison for four years, like Ahmed Altan. So I only speak about my own experience here, and I don't want to talk this down. But comparing to other cases, it was only one year. Ms. Koch, Güde Jensen spoke about this in her keynote speech. The ranking from Reporters Without Borders. Germany is listed 11th. Um, we can ask ourselves, why only number 11? Number one is Norway, 145, that's Turkey. And last one in the ranking is North Korea, 189, Jamaica on number six, Costa Rica number seven. So what do you think? Is that mirroring the situation well? Or where in Germany is pre freedom of the press under threat? Why are we only on place? Why are we only ranked number 11? Well, it's a great question. R the ranking published by Reporters Without Orders is uh, such a relevant list. Um, I don't know the exact details because I don't look at the list all the time. For me, this is like knowing um, about the football league. Uh, I mean, uh, we're not number one like um, Bavaria, the Bavarian football team, but we're also not, we don't also don't come in last. So we speak about very relevant issues here, the Philippines, Turkey. However, I also believe it's nothing most people deal with on, their n on an everyday basis. And I think it's something we have to do as journalists and politicians have to do. Dennis already said it. I think uh, it was quite a memorable event. Um, we were out there in front of the Brandenburg Gate, Axel Springer, uh, representatives were there, and we mm, had uh, uh, Jungle World was there, of course, and we had a concert in order to set to get you released from prison. So that's something, uh, that's social cohesion here in Germany, and it's important, but it doesn't really have to do with the ranking itself. Uh, do we um, deal with ourselves or with the people in our country? I think that would be more relevant, especially the people who don't live in the middle of Berlin. Um, most people in Germany live, um, don't live in major cities. They live on the countryside. and. Um, News rooms are usually equipped with people who live in cities. Why is that important? Well, because we also need to report on what's relevant to people who live on the countryside, what their concerns are. So there was um, a survey on public transport, 63% uh, of all people questioned said um, good, uh, but that was only in bigger cities, positive reply, and the rural answers uh, were more negative. I don't have the percentage here. Now, if we talk about journalists um, here and um, in Turkey, for example, about working conditions of our colleagues, I think what we need to work on is our credibility. Uh, and we have to make sure that those who oppress us, who oppress freedom of the press, freedom of opinion, that they cannot win the upper hand, that they cannot put us down. So to answer your question, I think if you look at Berlin verdicts, court decisions, uh, one thing is also interesting. Um, there was a verdict on a doctor here in Schöneberg in Berlin. So this is a Berlin court case. So he was supposedly sexually attacking his patients homosexually. So this was reported on, and um, the journalists were restricted. And it's not the first time that this has happened in Germany. So that's what, that's what I can say on your question. 
Germany ranking coming in at number 11 on the list. If players have financial means, political power, then they don't shy away from doing something. But uh, smaller newsrooms, smaller papers cannot do that. They cannot take a court case um, further. Ms. Leuthäuser-Schnernberger, Ms. Koch mentioned a very crucial term, credibility. And this credibility is decreasing, it's especially when it comes to people believing in the media. What is the threat to the media landscape if credibility wanes? Well, democracy is based on an independent executive, legislative, and judicial power, so a separation of powers. And uh, media, the media, a freedom, free reporting is the so-called fourth power. They have to stand up against insults. It's something they have to be able to deal with. And also, not only insults, but also threats. And they have to persevere. But of course, there's also targeted disinformation, storytelling, a kind of storytelling, um, conspiracy theories. Theory. So COVID-19 has been developed explicitly to harm human beings all over the world. It was developed uh, somewhere in China in a laboratory. And somewhere in the background, there are people pulling the strings. Um, and of course, the Jews are part of this scheme as well. So of course, a kind of distance and rationality is lacking for some. Most people m might say, well, it's something we wouldn't deal with. But then there are others who say, well, this has a certain degree of potential. People are worried about their future. They are concerned. They do not know what's going to happen in the future. What about my job? What about my children? What about my grandparents, especially now in the time of crisis? We are living in times of massive changes and upheaval. So you do feel a bit disempowered. And then someone comes along and has the story and tells you, well, those up there, they don't listen to you anymore. They don't take have your concerns at heart. The institutions don't seem to work anymore. The elite, the politicians up there. So if trust in political institutions is damaged, I mean, having a certain degree of mm, critical view on things is a good thing in itself. However, if trust is dismantled, especially also when it comes to the judiciary, when it comes to the, cur the court's verdict, then that can be a threat to our democracy. But I feel like we're still very far away from such a situation. What I see is that narratives, certain narrative stories are being spread more and more, and people suddenly listen to this. They are in their little bubbles, or how, whatever you would describe this on the social media. But at the same time, there are a lot of people, majority, who tr have trust in the institutions. And I would to like to add on something Mr. Yuxel just mentioned. We spoke about the what happened in the police department in Hesse. 30, so we're speaking about 30 people here that were involved in right-wing bubbles on social media. Um, if trust 
is attacked here, then this is a problem. I am commissioner f in the fight for anti-Semitism. If this leads, uh, puts us into a sa situation where people are scared to go to the police if they want to report something due to what has happened to harassment, to attacks, that would be a problem. That would be a major issue. So this is just a very recent example. That so we have to make sure that we make people accountable and make this public and talk about this continuously. You shouldn't believe that it's enough to just speak about it for a bit and handle this on a federal state level. No, we have to show that we are ready to put up our uh, sleeves and solve this. Now, one last uh, question to you. Where are the limits to freedom of the press? What can freedom of the press do and what not? Well, freedom of the press is, is very broad. It has the right to ask questions. Well, the ideal is even fact-based information to facilitate this fact-based information, but also comments, commenting, um, you have to differentiate this, of course, and make this visible and tangible. Uh, criticism is allowed, it's very welcome, welcome, of course, of course, I shouldn't pers um, um, insult someone personally or hurt someone. But apart from that, our way of reporting is secured. And a lot of things are brought to light. I mean, you can read up a lot on what happened, uh, what's going on in the banking sector, for example. Uh, we're now only uh, ranked, mm, uh, we only come in on um, place 11, number 11. Why that is, I don't exactly know. Maybe also. Uh, what is also relevant here is investigative journalism. We have certain rules and regulations here, and we have certain laws that make sure that we facilitate access to journalists. What is a journalist without his or her informants? They cannot do their job without them. Of course, there are certain court verdicts that limit their freedoms, but I have always made sure that they have a lot of possibilities. Mr. Yuxel, journalists have seen this happen to them often. Um, do journalists have to stand this? And this also goes um, for other people who are public fi figures. Is it something that's um, a means of our time. Yes, I do believe so. But to come back to the ranking, uh, let me just tell you and be quite honest, I am a contributor. I support Reporters Without Borders, but that's it basically. So from what I know, um, it was made difficult for journalists to do their reporting. But let us compare this to, this to the situation in Mexico. I heard this from Mexico, and I spoke a bit on the um, on Turkey, where and I heard well in Mexico we have the problem that journalists are being murdered. So I felt a bit better at that point. So, of course, there are crowds that are ready to be violent to attack you. And this is accounted for in the ranking. But it's also on the right to being informed um, and that the right citizens have. So there's not only the sign of the journalists who love reporting about something, to write about something. No, it's also in the interest of society as a whole. It is the journalists' um, contribution to make sure that citizens ca do have a right to be informed. And this includes the possibility to be informed um, from different angles. And that is why Germany um, dropped 
ranks in the ranking. I mean, Finland, Norway, you cannot pass them by because they are really the know-it-alls here. But even uh, putting the ranking aside, may I might be wrong here, but allow me to say that freedom of information is um, being influenced here, yeah, and it's something Tanit referred to as well. And I think in your answer, you were quite right uh, when you tried to answer the question, why only rank 11? I think it has a lot to do with the situation in other countries. So the first news I saw was in Rüsselsheim in Opel, at Opel. So this was a regional newspaper. So Rüsselsheimer Echo was there, of course, but part of the Darmstadt that echo, and those were the reds. Um, and this differentiation is made often in Germany. The press landscape in Germany is made up and like or used to be made up like that and still is. Regional newspapers are important. There are many regions where um, newspapers are dying, the new newspaper or others, the MUDs, for example, they are under pressure. So usually citizens uh, like to listen to many different stories, many different newspapers. And I think that is more and more under pressure. And this infringes on the right of the citizens to be informed. I mean, in Germany, I do not want to play down Pegida and others, but I think um, the dying newspapers are more of a problem. Um, ganz I don't know how many of you have an old-fashioned uh, newspaper subscription or maybe even a digital subscription. That, too, is something that influences news coverage, the, the options that news coverage has. In Germany, luckily, we have the public broadcasting stations, and these colleagues provide amazing work. They also receive our fees, obviously. Uh, the others, uh, Spiegel magazines, the Zeit newspaper, ha have to have the resources in order to provide this coverage. It costs money. It, it, it is expensive to send people on research for three months, for example. The publishing houses don't have enough money. And also when it came to the bosses of newspapers is having what, what has re increased is that you mentioned, you alluded to it, is freedom of expression at stake? My opinion, I, I used to be in, f in favor of strong opinions. Now I have <laughs> changed my opinion somewhat. Uh, it bores me. It, everybody has an opinion these days. It, it's, it's a bit annoying. This is also the complaint of uh, those who uh, take part in these corona demonstrations and protests. I think these, this perpetuous opinion is getting on my nerves. But when it comes to the question of repressions against journalists, you know, the fact that I was arrested has many reasons, but even before that, I was in the focus of the Turkish government. For example, I wasn't given an accreditation. They just didn't process my apl application. I didn't even get a denial. So I know from several resources that it wasn't my comments about uh, Erdogan's uh, policy that they took offense of, but rather I was the one who went to the Kurdish regions the most. There was also an interview when I interviewed the number two of the PKK I was only a mediator, and it was a critical interview, yes, uh, which uh, not only I <laughs> would admit to, but also the Turkish uh, Constitutional Court said uh, after I was released. 
all the news paper articles that I was blamed for everything was reviewed and they ruled that this there's no indication for any crime but in the majority of these texts it was not about my opinion about I me saying I that I dislike Erdogan and now this takes me back to what I said it having this opinion is does come at a cost I don't know if we will have a Q and A with the audience, but you know, if we ask the question of what we can do, what citizens can do, is subscribe to a newspaper if you can afford it. Uh, have several subscriptions. Of course, you can't subscribe to uh, all the news outlets. I have a few, but you know, wha what kind of news outlet you subscribe to doesn't really matter. But what matters is to strengthen the media as a fourth power in our society. They won't survive if society doesn't take care of them. And this means not taking everything, uh, f you know, uh, free of charge, because Russia today is free of charge and it will stay that way. Um, Mr. Ujel said it, opinion, opinion, opinion. Do we need more journalists with an attitude or are we as journalists only observers who render what uh, the policymakers utter, no matter how absurd it is. No, I think we are not that, and we have never been that. Um, I just want to add something to what um, Dennis Ujel said. Also, the uh, RTL Media Group has the the opportunity to uh, enter into a subscription. So. Of course, ntv.de has a great app which is free of charge with uh, uh, with commercials, and um, if you subscribe to it, it's free. It's without ads. But uh, you know, we are talking about the future of political discourse. I don't really agree with you that we have to add a commentary to a commentary commentary i think as long as it's transparent and if we have capital letters often we have this transparency as well when it comes to tv news this is somewhat more difficult to have a commentary uh, often the the audience doesn't really accept this this procedure so it really we need to differentiate in terms of what genre we are talking about the the danger is that we focus too much on attitude. I think uh, having a backbone is much more important than having an attitude, but this no not only relates to our industry, but also to others. The question is how we want to approach this society in the future. How do we want to deal with social media? This was already mentioned. What I am witnessing is an, an increasingly amplified culture of complaining and um, so you, do you use Twitter then? Yes. Well, sometimes if somebody issues a really bad statement, I also make a comment, but then I contact them and I send them a really much more differentiated email. I think the social media also create more transparency because maybe we used to use a quote uh, which was taken out of context. This is no longer possible. We are being held uh, ac accountable as journalists now to a much higher extent, which is important, which is a good thing, because it forces us to be much more diligent in our work. But it also causes a situation in which we uh, scream at each other much more. It not only affects journalists, but also journalists who say something about people which they wouldn't say to their faces. This creates a divide and an increasing conflict which sometimes makes it impossible to accept that somebody, has, somebody else has a different opinion. It's not about whether you have an opinion or not. It's about whether you accept the opinion that somebody else has, whether it hurts or not. We've heard a lot about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the 
a S Supreme Court justice who just died, who said, both in marriages and in the rest of life, it doesn't hurt to be a bit deaf. And you know, sometimes you should listen. She should listen closely and not pretend to be deaf. But sometimes it might be the better option not to join in, in the struggle or in the argument, take a deep breath and not partake in every uh, eruption that you come across. And something that I was fascinated about uh, with this uh, Supreme Court Justice, she was good friends with uh, somebody in the Supreme Court who was a Catholic and who was opposed to abortion. And this woman, this very liberal woman, didn't have any trouble going on holiday with her colleague who was totally illiberal. And this is something we witness rather rarely today. Every but we need to be successful in doing so in all private realms so that nobody will get the impression that they cannot speak their minds anymore. You alluded to it. In which way are the media also responsible for these indignation waves that occur ever more frequently? How much responsibility do the media have? I am referring to both classical and social media. I don't really want to talk about the media because there's a lot of different, there's a lot of diversity. But in terms of this indig indignation wave, we of course need to take care of finding out whether these are the topics that people are interested in and the topics because of which we um, are protected by the basic law. Rainer Brüderle, your party colleague, was once um, became the victim of a smear campaign. It was a huge media topic. And then there was a member of parliament who was caught with crystal meth in a Berlin flat. Most of the media didn't really want to shed a lot of lines on this topic, not as much as the uh, Brüderle case, even though it was a criminal offense. And a few weeks later, the member of parliament was a host in a, at a talk show. We're talking about Volker Beck, uh, obviously. So only mere weeks later, Volker Beck made this a private matter. So if you talk about people, talk with people about what it means that a member of parliament gets illegal drugs, financing the mafia, and so on, and so on, and what's the difference between si this situation and uh, a slip of the tongue at a bar in the middle of the night? So what's, uh, is this the same level, or uh, where's the proportionality? If we get indignated, if we want to complain about something, um, we, we need to make up our minds what readers really should um, be interested in. What are they interested in? It's our decision, but in the end it should be based on our aim to r reach these people and not um, cover them, but provide coverage for them. Ms. Lord has a No, Mr. Yuje. I think the examples you mentioned are really good, even though they were a while ago. It's it's a good example of how these indignation processes work. I don't have an opinion about everything, but I can still remember commenting on both of these occurrences. In both cases, I defended the, those policy makers. Um, Rainer Brüderle in the Tats but Volk and Volker Beck in the, in the Welt. It would have been easier the other way around, but that's the way it was. So I think your plea, I think it's not the meant the way you said it, but what's in it is that in one case, indignation was wrong. It was it would have been more correct to be indignated about the other case. And this is what uh, tabloid, the way tabloid media 
work. I, I'm not really opposed to tabloid media. Uh, but, you know, the Bild uh, newspaper used to be somewhat of a m monopoly. And, but tabloid journalism uh, relies on indignation. I think we won't find a way out if we, you know, it w it's always like this. Some um, get worked up at about a simple fuck you. And the last time it was the same people who th said, oh, it's not that bad, it's, it's no biggie. So I think this indignation, this culture of indignation is annoying. I, I don't think it's terrible, but it's a bit annoying. Everything is, stops shortly before the abyss. And many, something that we hear a lot and something that is worrisome is this, these waves of indignation. I think these are annoying. You know, there was this case with Dieter Nuhr with the German Research Society. This was a prime example for where the problem really is, namely the incapability or the inability Maybe it will even take a few more years to find out how to deal with it. But at the moment, it seems that the institutions, all kinds of institutions, are incapable of dealing with criticism and with indignation. And Dieter Nuhr in the, with the German Research Society was a prime example. So they made all kinds of absurd suggestions it went to uh, and fro and uh, in the end the uh, the research society was really embarrassed or it, it embarrassed itself well you don't have to ask Dieter Nur for such a statement but if you do you need to tolerate it you need to be able to put up with it this is why such indignation I is often so popular, because you can tell that it's effective, partly because editorial departments work like this. You need to, <laughs> y you just need to issue a lot of hashtags and at some point something will happen. Sometimes I have been a part uh, of these uh, waves of indignation, but usually it's not about somebody being indignated. But that's usually not the problem. The problem often is that institutions of all kinds lack uh, integrity. You can also reply to criticism without um, reacting so absurdly as the German Research Society did. Can I just add two points? I think the difficulty is not really that we get indignated, but rather that we no longer have under control what we um, rise up against, what we are disgusted about. And this is dangerous in my opinion, because if people no longer feel represented by the media, they will find somebody else who they can relate to. And we need to take care that we not uh, ape what people say, but find a way to relate to it. I think the German Research Society made a mistake. I think they won't do it twice. It was corrected and then we can all um, let it go. I shook my head. I retweeted, retweeted someone. We tried to get Dieter Nuhr to join an interview. I hope this is not a secret. He was interested but uh, he said that he was having discussions with the research society and if they worked out he didn't there wou would have been no need to be appalled uh, publicly in an interview with us you mentioned that uh, social media hasn't 
existed for a long time in in the context of human the history of humankind social media is five minutes old uh, Kitty Jensen said that we need to teach the, y the young generation's media competence I don't know who of you here uses TikTok. I don't think that we should link this to a, s a specific generation and we mustn't say we must reproach a specific group of people of being stupid. I think we need citizens' competence with journalists. Journalists don't have constituencies, unlike policymakers. So we need to f come up with a way to get closer to the citizens we address. So maybe we should leave Twitter every once in a while, because A topic only uh, gains broad publicity if it leaves Twitter. So sometimes the temptation is very high to take up a topic on Twitter, but sometimes it's wiser to leave leave a certain topic. May I ask a certain question? I can feel what you want to address i don't think it's only the wave of the waves of digna indignation it's also a matter of you know how our language functions the, the insults and so on i want to name an example it's a rather young example you will be able to judge it by judicial means is our communication still subject to rules if a member of parliament has to accept being called a piece of shit? There were other names she was called. This has something to do with the uh, crudification of our language. Are there still any rules to abide by? Ms. Lortesa Schnarrenberger, I think we need to differentiate because especially when it comes to what you just mentioned, and there were 50 other names she was called all in all 22 terms and the court had to uh, sort out what was justifiable in a political context and it went through the social media nobody took a stand in front of Miss Koch but rather there was name calling there was uh, there were anonymous utterances and they were revised by a court of course, in the political discourse, it needs to be possible that y you don't have to say sorry for three, uh, sorry three times if you have a different opinion. But every time uh, it becomes a defamation and an insult, there needs to be a limit. And the court said and ruled that in a, in a political discourse, more is possible. We don't want to rule everything to death so they filtered out six or seven terms which were more uh, insulting and the the others were not insulting where it didn't really see a difference so this is hard to comprehend so there are rules but they are not often easy to enforce because they are linked to political assessment i wanted to speak a bit about the DFG. Uh, we speak about this with the term of cancel culture. This also comes from stems from the US, but we also do it here in Germany. So for certain topics, uh, we like to moralize and we like to tell people, well, we cannot discuss this. We cannot talk about this. For example, about certain controversial topics topics like the headscarf so there was one example uh, where a discussion was planned a panel discussion on the headscarf and then a shitstorm happened colleagues also said well we cannot do this it will um, promote prejudices and then others said well why can a university university not host a panel discussion yes it's a controversial topic but let us speak about this and open it up make it accessible and 
scientific. Where else should we do this? And that, I think, is difficult and that is dangerous because um, if people think they have the right stance, the right opinion, and then if someone else wants to um, have opinion, a different opinion on this, then not speak about it. So not insult, not documents or dispute. Um, so th in that case, I have an opinion of my own. Um, what is important, what is relevant is to have those spaces. Um, so let me get to your question. When it comes to social media, I think this is radicalized or po and polarized here a lot. And that's what makes it m more and more difficult. So if I initiate a debate, a discussion, should I really do this? Because I'm going to get insulted anyway. So there's a limit to this. Um, there is a brutalization to language. If you no longer believe you have a certain kind, a certain degree of responsibility, and you just write something just because you feel like it. So the way I understand Twitter is that it's an important mouthpiece. So that many journalists look at Twitter in the morning. They try to filter what's relevant, what's being spoken about. And this is not questioned. Um, they do seem to have a certain relevance and influence. However, we have to differentiate here. We, we cannot react to every stupid idea that's being proposed on Twitter. Sometimes you have just have to ignore it. I read something on this because the likes apparently also um, promote this. If you instead of a like button, you had a respect button, then that would change the situation. Um, I will support this respect respectfully. Of course, this is not going to happen because uh, out of economical issues from the corporation, well, just to like something to make it more relevant, I don't think it's a good thing. Mr. Excel, you're a bit nervous. Do you feel like saying something? Well, if I may. Yes, please. Well, then, of course. Just to start with, maybe. I spoke about the DFG a bit negatively. Uh, let me just say I only used this as an example because it went so completely wrong. It could have gone the other way. This I really just wanted to say I used this um, because I thought it was a good example. I'm also f optimistic that the DFG will not repeat its error. Well, uh, let me also say something on the university. I think it happened at a time when I wasn't f mm, available f mm, professionally. There was a university professor, I think, at a time, and uh, a politician uh, who was very successful and then went back to work at the university. And there were many protests. And uh, well, this is also some part of the job of students, right? A lot of newspapers had um, had, had uh, wrote about this, had headlines on this. Um, is our freedom at stake? Well, I don't think it can be done here, but there were criminal offenses going on. So a piece of fassbender was restricted and um, trespassing was part of the criminal offense. And so there was this example, there was this case um, where a theatrical piece was inhibited from going on stage. And speaking about this, discussing this, it's something we have to withstand. It's something we have to fiercely debate. And uh, then another example, Angela Merkel. She was asked in an interview right after 
following a certain discussion, is freedom of the press, freedom of expression under threat in Germany? And her answer was no, because not having um, an opinion or having an opinion means also to be contradicted. Even a so-called shitstorm. That's what Angela Merkel said in this interview, and I think she's right. And I think it's also very difficult in this kind of debate. A lot of people like to voice their opinions loud and clear, but then if there are certain reactions, contradictions to it, then they don't like to hear it. But it's part of an open society. And we cannot be squeamish about it. Um, this can cause steer some riot, but well, Ms. Koch, do you want to say something here? Well, I absolutely agree if we're speaking about moods, about a certain atmosphere. Well, let me just say that it was also said on Twitter, uh, it is important, it is important to get indignated. Let me also say I don't use Twitter a lot. I don't uh, look at the tweets a lot. I'm still on Turkey's Twitter page, uh, even though I don't write about Turkey as much anymore and I'm not the correspondent there anymore. But I know that Turkey can still steer a certain degree of indignation, in Germany at least. And that's why I still take this into account. And that also goes for many countries. There are many countries where there's censors censorship uh, and the Internet is still free, at least to a certain extent. And the same goes for Germany. Yeah. I spoke to a young gentleman recently before George Floyd. He was attacked by the police. Um, so this case is at the court right now. I, mean, I spoke to this ch young gentleman. And he, I believed him. He seemed to be very credible because as a journalist, you do have a certain feeling for these kind of things. I believed he was very credible in what he spoke about. There was a, a video, there were NGOs who streamed this, two million clicks. So this is in Essen. And the Essen judiciary now takes this seriously. Of course, the situation in other countries are different. But it is, uh, well, social media is a way to get people to listen to you. Social media also control us, um, journalists and traditional media. Erdogan called Twitter a plague, and he has his reasons to do so. I do, did speak a bit. Um, talkingly about social media, but they are also something good. Well, I do think social media are neither good nor bad. They are a tool, but l oh, let me also speak about the brutalization of language. I don't even think we have to speak about brutalization in most cases to see that we do not t speak to our audience. Mm. When now, when we hear about the protests, the demonstrations, the corona protests, uh, there are conspiracy theorists, and a lot of people are immediately called people who deny corona, even though if you just voice a certain criticism, you're immediately denying corona. 78%, 83% support the political means taken with regard to COVID-19. Only 70% uh, doubt them. And um, it can seem disproportionate sometimes if you're standing in the restaurant, but 
it's also it has to be possible for you to say, well, I do think here it's a bit arbitrary, a bit disproportionate, um, but po political regulations or rules and re COVID rules and regulations are like you don't have to be denying Corona all in its. Um, or completely. Well, I had the great honor to meet someone who thoroughly believes in chemtrails, and he explained to me how it works, what chemicals they use, and how we are subject to political violence. So I thought to myself, well, I will just Google something and read it to him. There was a a Spiegel report, and already in the first sentence it said conspiracy theory, which it is. And he told me that, well, if you speak about it, you're immediately someone who believes in conspira th conspiracy theory. And then I suddenly noticed, if you don't speak to and about people in the way you're supposed to, then you cannot convince them. So if you tell someone who believes in conspiracy theories, um, that he is in that category. Why should he or she even speak to you or believe what you say? I've heard this in many cases. Um, proofs might even be more misleading, but family and friends are important. Not because they make fun of you, but uh, because they question. Um, they pose questions and they explain something. Some things sometimes. Uh, we cannot only report f mm, or write for conspiracy theorists, but we can take this into account. And language is relevant here. So it's not only about the brutalization of language in order not to be able to speak to them. Ms. Leutheuser Schnerberger, time is snapping at our heels. So maybe you can summarize. How can we as a society, all of us, not only journalists and politicians and lawyers, how can we safeguard freedom of press, freedom of expression? Well, by participating actively, using, applying the correct uh, good language, by trying to be a bit less ignited, indignated, and to make use of social media, make use of the internet, because I can find many things there, facts, um, explanations, amongst others. So let us reflect, let us question, let us not just take any everything for granted or accept and put up with everything. Let us. Um, discuss, criticize, and let us participate. Let us uh, be part. Um, t going to the court can only be a last resort. We have many other institutions that support us. You're not on your own. And remember, we don't have to react to the last stupid idea or to everything. Um, get a subscription, be informed, Mr. Yüksel. Um, you mentioned your imprisonment, so in the final statements, I am brave enough to ask you a last question, maybe a quick answer. Um, what about your hope? Are you hopeful? Um, so your lawyer said he's going to lodge an appeal. So what do you think? Will you be, will the verdict, verdict be not guilty? Will you be acquitted? I think I'm quite hopeful. Not like Jim Ding, a Turkish colleague who was in a similar situation. He reported on war sales in connection con with Al-Qaeda. And it was absolutely irrational. 
was like it had to do with blood revenge so he is still spoken about a lot and he said Erdogan said well as long as I'm on this chair he will not leave prison but Erdogan was really he just he was just very irritated and annoyed and fed up basically with me but he doesn't speak about me anymore he couldn't hear my name anymore he was very much annoyed and this in Germany and in Turkey so when the federal government stepped in and did not have a public, um, um, an open public recommendation not to invest in Turkey anymore to German entrepreneurs. So there were many things um, that happened. Also, the government took out a guarantee. And well, I was approached and I was asked to just leave quietly. And there are many things I cannot speak about, but I was convinced by my wife, my friends, and um, my colleagues from the VED also came to visit me. I didn't want the federal government to step in too much because that would have given the Turkey the possibility to. Um, mark me as an agent of the German government. So in short, they wanted to get rid of me. And I think we've seen the verdict of the Constitutional Court, and it's a positive one, especially when it comes to freedom of the press. This was right after the municipal elections in Istanbul took place. It was a great verdict, and this court co knew they had to either get in trouble with the constitution, constitutional court or the head of state. So of course they went for the constitutional court. I think question will, questions will arise and I'm pretty sure that uh, in the end my court case will end with me being released because they don't want me there. Putting me back into m insulation, into prison so I think they were already so they already put me into solitary confinement and that made them happy but I think they were so fed up so annoyed that they actually regretted going down this path I think leaving prison I don't think it would have been possible without Germany's support that's the only reason that made this possible I'm very grateful to each and every one and I'm still thankful to those who regret having supported me. Thank you. Ms. Kochmann, Ms. Leuthäuser-Schnarrenberger, Mr. Yüksel, thank you so much for speaking with me here. Dear spectators, dear audience, thank you so much for listening in. I would like to have a quote. Agwa Ganshi said the free word if it doesn't lead to violence, is not a crime anywhere in the world. So stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye.